He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. It always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That, it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. So we are in a series called? The Hero Within. All right. The Hero Within, eight of you know it. The same eight that read the email are the ones that knew. I'm going to just like not write. I'm, I need to get over it. I need to get over it. I need to get over it. The eight pe I'll write the email for the eight people that love me. You're welcome. We're in a series called The Hero Within. And his name is Jesus. And he wants to make you a hero without. Our world is desperately short on heroes. Because... For the most part, we do not have people to see that can help us transition into being heroes. When there are no heroes, there are no heroes to breed. Heroes breed heroes. And so if we don't have heroes, or if we have fake heroes, like basketball stars and Hollywood movie people, dear Jesus, <sighs> Uh, this is why people that are contrary to the kingdom of God want society to be ignorant of history. This is why they've gone into the public schools and they've removed um, heroes like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. These are actual legitimate heroes. They've removed them from history, turning them into racists or whatever, whatever they've tried to turn them into. The reason for that is because if you have no heroes, you cannot be a hero. If you have bad heroes, you become a bad hero. Amen. That's why the enemy is convincing his minions to go into and destroy some of those things. Like, for example, fathers in general should, be, uh, should have heroism in them. It's, it's been put in there by God. I... One of, the, one of the first and only times my son ever made me cry, he didn't even, he didn't even know it, his, one of his teachers, I think he was in kindergarten first grade or something like that, one of his teachers gave the whole class the assignment of telling who your hero was to the whole class. And so, you know, everybody in the class had Superman and, you know, whoever the cool cartoon people or uh, a bunch of them, you know, football stars, basketball stars, all that kind of stuff. And my son wrote that his dad was his hero. And to be fair, like, I was Waffle House guy. I wasn't even my own hero, let alone, but I didn't realize how much God puts into a little boy or a little girl that they have got to have a father and a mother. And why do you think society is trying to tear that apart? They're trying to glorify single mothers and turn them into superheroes. They're not superheroes. They're broken people that God is giving them grace to. God didn't intend for it to ever, ever be a single mother, ever. He didn't intend for there to ever be an absent father or an emotionally disconnected father or a so career driven that they didn't have time for their family father. That was, none of that was God's intentions. That's what society has done. Done a great job of it. So if you're in here and I, and I hit you with any of that, I'm not condemning or shaming or good. I'm just telling you, this is God's way is the right way. And he gives grace for anything that's outside of that. So if you're a single mom or if you were an absent dad, or, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make you feel terrible in here. I'm trying to tell you that we need to bring things back to God's way if we're going to have the blessings and, and the opportunities in our society that God intended for us to have. 
which means that we have to be the carriers of the truth. Just because it's been bad, we don't get to say, well, it's been bad, I guess we'll just keep it bad. No, if it's something's wrong, our responsibility as children of God is to make it right, even if it makes us look bad. I haven't always been a good father. I haven't always been a good husband. I haven't always been a good anything. That's why I have to lean into the heart of God and lean into the grace of God and understand the scriptures so that I can be better at all the things that God has called me to do. So if you're not there, get there. You can get there. The grace of God will take you there. It, 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 I can promise you, God will not leave you in a broken place because that's not who he is. He is, he is the God of redemption. If you, this, is, uh, this is one of the things that, that hits me uh, quite often is parents who come to the realization after their kids are, are grown or somewhat grown that they parented wrong. And so instead of acknowledging it, instead of doing the adult thing, the grown-up thing, the, the, the spiritually mature thing, and acknowledging that they did it wrong, they just double down and keep doing it wrong. Like your kids don't know. The problem is, is that when parents do that, what they end up doing is perpetuating that into the next generation, and it gets worse. It never gets, it's never the same. When it gets passed on to the next generation, it either goes down or it goes up. Which is why God gives grandparents a special grace <laughs> to deal with their, <laughs> their self-perpetuating issues, some of them. If you're a parent in this room and you've got grown kids, you, you don't get to say, well, I did it wrong. I guess we'll just stay with it because I don't want my kids to think that I was a hypocrite or I was wrong or I did it bad. You need to tell your kids that you were a hypocrite, that you were wrong, that you did it bad, because you know what they're going to hear? <laughs> My parents are authentic. They're listening to God, and they're actually willing to tell me that something was wrong? Yeah. You, you know how, how refreshing that is to a child's heart for their parents to say, I'm sorry. Yeah. I missed it. Yeah. I was wrong. It's possible to be a parent and wrong at the same time. I know, I know, crazy, but it's possible. And you go to your kid and say, here's where I was wrong. This is what I did wrong. Please don't do that. And then your kid is going to be like, wow, that's actually the scriptures. We're supposed to read the entire Old Testament. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe, that you're supposed to use the Old Testament and learn what not to do. If you learn something as an adult, as a Christian or whatever, and you know that it changed something in you, one of the greatest, most powerful things you could do is go to someone who was negatively affected by the way that you used to be and say, hey, you know what I got a revelation of? And I'm sorry. And I'm not going to do that anymore. You please hold me accountable because I did that thing to you. And I would love for you to hold me accountable for this change that the Lord has revealed to my heart. You know, when you expose that darkness to the light, it shrivels up like a vampire. Uh, I'm going to stop. In this series, my desire is to raise up an entire church full of heroes that are going to raise up entire communities full of heroes. Amen. Amen. The, the legacy of Lena will be, man, you know that like 300 heroes came out of that town? Like, yeah, that's right. Jesus was working hard. If you remember Clark Kent, who was AKA Superman incognito, that's what every one of us is. Every one of us is Clark Kent, but right on the inside, one millimeter below your epidemic, Epiderma. I just need skin. We're starting a school. I'm on the school board. Yeah. Amen. Right below your skin, one millimeter below your skin is Christ. Not a Christ, not some of Christ, not Christ Jr., not half a Christ. 
the Christ that created the world and then came back later on, 4,000 years later, and saved the world. The Christ that went to hell, beat every demon and Satan himself, had a parade, epic duomai, in hell, drugged Satan and his terrible stank carcass all over the streets of hell, and then was raised as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords forever to reign on the throne as the Son, the highest place of God that has ever been done. That Christ is on the inside of you one millimeter below your skin. And many times we look in the mirror and we say, man, is that a new pimple? Because we're carnal. We're Clark Kent, who's actually Superman, but he's got the persona of Clark Kent, and we just stay Clark Kent. We walk down the street, this person's getting mugged over here, this car's on fire, this baby's falling out of the... And we're like, man, I wish somebody would... Lord, please send a... And the whole time, all you got to do is just go... I'm here... Baby, fire. And what was the other one? Mugging? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Super punch ya. In Colossians 1.27, it says, God did this because he wanted you Gentiles, and I scratched off Gentiles in my Bible and put beloved. You can do what you got to do. Put your name there if you want to put your name there. God did this because he wanted you Gentiles, you, beloved, you, Steve, to understand his wonderful and glorious mystery. God is not trying to keep secrets from, from you. <laughs> he kept secrets for us, not from us, for us. But they're revealed unto us by his spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the whole chapter uh, explains that. And the mystery is, so here's Paul giving us the, the, the quick version of the, of the mystery. The mystery, not a mystery, the mystery. Article the mystery, which is Christ lives in you. Christ lives in you. Christ doesn't take naps in you. Christ isn't in a zombie state in you. Christ isn't inactively... La, uh, trapped in a cage in you. Christ is living in you. The same way that God's always lived, with the same perpetual and never ending and regenerating life. The same quality and quantity of life that God Himself possessed before the universe was even created. Out of his words, he created a universe. That's the mystery of the Christ who lives in you. In addition, he is your hope. Hope is blueprint. It's another way to say hope is godly imagination. You can use Christ and apply your godly imagination to him as you read through the scriptures and see him in operation that that is the kind of glory that God wants you to possess. The word glory in the Greek is doxa, and it means of high value and high opinion. So when you see God have an incredibly high value and high opinion of Jesus Christ, that's the value and the opinion that he actually has of you. And you need to get an imagination, a blueprint, that God actually thinks that way towards you. That the thoughts that he thinks towards you are good and not evil to give you a hope and a future. He's thinking good things towards you. He has great plans for you. He has a, a blueprint for your life that is filled with blessing and joy and victory because he's already gone before. If you remember, those of you that are my age, which is really young, that Superman had a, actually the Justice League had a saying that they were fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. And that's cool, and that's great, but that's cartoon. I'm going to fix it and make it spiritual and supernatural, that we're fighting for truth, justice, God's justice, and the kingdom way. 
God desires for his kingdom to come and his will to be done in our lives, in our planet, in your body, in your marriage, in your children, in your finances, in your whatever you got. He wants the kingdom to be done there as it is in heaven. How much depression is in heaven? How much sickness is in heaven? How much misery is in heaven? How many muggings? How many flat tires? History always belongs to the heroes. History always belongs to the heroes. I, I want to live my life in such a way that it makes a mark. I do not want to be a social security number. <laughs> I didn't even ask for one. My mom got it for me. <laughs> I know, mom. <laughs> you know why? I could not have a savings account without a social security number. Figure that out. And so we had to go, I remember it distinctly. I was like seven or eight years old and I finally figured out how to get some money and I wanted to put it in the bank. And they wouldn't let me put my money in the bank until I had a social security number. So we had to go all the way across town and get a social security card. I do not want to be a social security number. I do not want to be another lemming, another number another person. I want to make my mark on history the way my father intended for me to do. And it's not just me, y'all. God is no respecter of persons. Each of us were birthed by God to be history makers and history changers. If you want to make and change history, embrace being a hero. History belongs to the heroes. In Psalm chapter 16, verse 3, God says it's the godly people in the land that are his heroes. Even if history doesn't recognize you, you want your father in heaven to say, you know what, that person, that church, that group, they are my heroes. I live my life to please my father, I'm not living my life to please any man, or any woman. I'm not living my life to please my wife or my mom. I honor them both, I love them both, but I am not living my life to please either of them. I'm living my life to please my father. And the more godly my mom and my wife are, the more I'll be pleasing to them. This, this will help some of you because you're worried about how other people think about you. And some of the times when people come to me and they ask me about these kind of situations, I'll say, well, how godly are they? Well, they're not really. So why are you worried about what their opinion is? It, that's important. If you're trying to please ungodly people, there's only one way to do that. If you're trying to please godly people, then you have to please God first. If they're godly. Some folks literally have this backwards. They're trying to please the ungodly and offend the godly. And they wonder why their life is messed up. Please God. Make it simple. I'm a simple guy. You know you've heard me say that a lot. I'm a very simple person. I, it, I wake up, I want to please my father. I want to do what he's created me to do. I want to do it well. I don't even want to make myself loved by God. And I know that messes with people. Because God's going to love me wheels off as much as he possibly can, whether I'm good or evil. He'll love me the same today, whether I, I nail it on, on this message or whether I go out and, and kick kittens and, and do whatever evil people do. <laughs> I don't know. I got, I got to be careful. I, sometimes I have things that go through my head that don't need to come out my mouth. I know I'm the only one. You guys are so holy. God loves me the same. God loves you the same whether you're holy, amazing, wonderful, or whether you're terrible, sinner, ungodly. It's not his love that should be the focus of how you do your life, how you live your life. It should be his pleasure. Because there's people in this room that are more pleasing unto God than others. That's just true. I'm sorry. If, if that offends you, you can change it. If that blesses you, way to go. Up thumb. Uh, I'm, I'm on your side. 
But I live my life. I want my thought life. I want my walk life. I want every part of my life to be pleasing to God. And the way I can do that is by looking at his will in the scriptures. His will is his word. His word is his will. The godly people in the land are God's true heroes, and he takes pleasure in them. I want to please my father. I want to please my father. And there's, I, one of the reasons for me, and this might be different for me than for a lot of people in this room, so that, that might be why. But I lived a bunch of years not pleasing God. And I know that. He loved me. He had mercy for me. He wanted to extend grace towards me. But I know I lived a bunch of years not pleasing God. And it breaks my heart to say it, let alone knowing that I did it. And I don't know where you're at, but I can tell you that that's, that's the worst thing that I have in my heart. I'm not condemned, but there's a legitimate godly sorrow to the fact that I lived years of my life not pleasing God. And I'll live, I will never live another one. I'll never live another one. That's a God word. In August of 1776, think back. Remember that day? In August of 1776, while we were losing the War of Independence, and some people don't understand history, they don't know that we were on the brink of absolute disaster. Britain was the, by far, world's most powerful empire on earth. At this time in history, it was, it was said that the sun never set on the British Empire. And it's true because they own so many different places all around the globe that somewhere in British control, the sun was always up. The sun never set on the British Empire. They were by far, by far, not even close, anybody, the strongest and most powerful military on earth. And here we are, little fledgling bunch of rabble-rousers trying to grow tobacco, and do our American thing, and we're going to bust loose from the most powerful military on, our, on earth. They, in Britain, when, this, when these things started to happen, they, it was laughable. But it was right. It would be like if we found out that New Guinea wanted to invade America. You'd be like, e what? New Gu do they have guns? Where's New Guinea? I know, you're going to be thinking about it. Stop thinking about it. Listen to me. In August of 1776, while we were losing the War of Independence, George Washington wrote a desperate plea for reinforcements to Governor Jonathan Trumbull of Connecticut. He, and uh, Governor Trumbull uh, asked for nine regiments of Connecticut militiamen to join the fight with General Washington so that we could win our liberty. And then he wrote back to General Washington after he had asked for these nine regiments of reinforcements. And this is what he said to General Washington. In this day of calamity, to trust altogether to the justice of our cause. Without our utmost exertion would be tempting providence. He was calling them out saying, you need to give it everything you got because your cause is just. And then he says, march on, exclamation point to the general losing the war against the largest military on earth. March on. This shall be your warrant. The word warrant means justification or authority. This shall be your authority. This shall be your justification. 
play the man of God. And the word play means uh, to have the character of. He said, have the character of a man of God. And for the cities of our God, may the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, be your captain, your leader, your conductor, and your savior. While we are losing the war of independence against the largest nation in the world, the governor of Connecticut writes to George Washington and says, be a man. Be a man of God. And you fight for just things. You do the right thing. Otherwise, you're tempting providence. While he's losing the war. Now, we would consider that to be very anti-church. Because when people come up and they're whiny, mopey, and broken, we want to pick them up and be like Jesus in a lot of people's Sunday schools and go sit on a rock with our long blonde hair and our blue eyes and pet their little sheepy hide and tell them it's going to be okay. God loves you. You're so sweet. Thank God Governor Trumbull played his part in the American Revolution and he told George Washington to man up. What we used to say in Texas was cowboy up big boy, put your spurs on, get on your horse, and get after it. I'll send you reinforcements, but you man up. And this is not okay in society today. We're raising porcelain dolls. Guys and girls, I'm not picking on God, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm saying as believers, we are all sons of God. It's not a gender term. It's an identity term. It's an inheritance term. And I believe that God in heaven, especially in this hour, as we're going into the great awakening, with the enemy doing what the enemy's trying to do in this particular time, I believe that the resounding sound from heaven is, man up! Face your fears. Face those people that are coming to destroy this earth. Fight back against the darkness. It's time for the, for the bride to be a full-grown bride and not a little bitty two-year-old girl. Jesus is not coming back for a little bitty two-year-old girl playing with her dollies. He's coming back for a bride. And she knows who she is. And we don't have that church today, and we need to have that church today. That church is filled with heroes. Coloss uh, the most accepted and pervasive sin in the Christian today the most accepted and pervasive sin in the Christian, and I use that term in quotes, in the Christian today is a four-letter F word. Shout it out if you know it. Fear. 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 How much of our life is directed by, driven by, like we're in the back, the very back seat of the short bus, and the driver's name is Fear. Fear. And we're wondering why life is going the way it's going. If fear drives your bus, I'm going to read two verses out of Joshua. I'm not going to go there. This was just prompted on me. I know. You're, she's looking at me like, that's not here. I know. It's from Jesus. <laughs> so just deal with it. These, these poor folks, on the, not poor, but these amazing folks that run the scripture, that run the, the screen, it is, it is but for the grace of God that they don't shoot me. <laughs> Joshua chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. I'm going to read this out of the BSB. Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 out of the BSB. And this is one of the seven times that this language was used towards Joshua. The first time it was used was in Deuteronomy chapter like 32. I'd have to, don't, don't quote me on that. But the first time this language was used, Moses was basically commissioning even people. He said, hey, you're going to go into the promised land. I'm not going with you because I did the stupid and so I got to die. But Joshua's going to take you. You're going to be fine. And he tells the people you, people, be strong and very courageous. Now, most of us 
only really have a grid that it was just in Joshua chapter 1 that God told Joshua, be strong and very courageous. He actually told him, I think, three times in Joshua chapter 1. But we don't really understand that it was like three or four chapters before where God commanded the people to be strong and very courageous. But then God doubled down, tripled down on Joshua. Hey, leader, they're supposed to be strong and very courageous, so guess what you have to be? You have to be three times as strong and three times as courageous to lead these people to be strong and courageous. Heroes breed heroes. No one shall stand against you all the days of your life. Is this just for Joshua? Do you know what Jesus' name is? Yeshua. Yeshua. Joshua is Yeshua. Jesus is Yeshua. Those that have Yeshua in them... No one shall stand against you all the days of your life. That's you, beloved. Amen. Well, so-and-so's standing against me. So-and-so's doing this. So-and-so's doing that. Why are you letting them? Amen. Why are you letting them? Folks just can't come and do anything they want to to you. I had this conversation with a pastor not that long ago where he was saying, oh man, this is going on and my wife is doing this and my kids are doing this and the devil this and demons this. Like he had it all figured out. And I, lit, I finally, after like 15 minutes, I finally stopped him. I'm like, stop. I, I didn't say shut up, so you guys should be happy. I said, stop. I said, why are you letting, why are you letting all this happen? You're a minister of God. Well, you know, my wife did this, and, and my kid this, and the devil. I said, I know, you told me. Why are you letting it? He's like, what are you even talking about? I said, I will guarantee that none of those situations are going to happen to me. And he's like, well, how could you say that? I said, because if your wife walked into my house and did me like you just said she did you, I'd throw her sorry butt out on the sidewalk. Well, I can't throw my wife. Like, no, so you're just going to stand there and let her do that? And I, Now, listen, I know I just, man, I should have. Back up, beep, beep, beep. Oh boy, how do you unravel that one? Okay, I'm not a wife beater, I'm not a woman thrower, I'm not, I'm saying, I'm talking in like spiritual, like verbal context. See, people just can't come and assault you just at will. It, you have to allow it. I, uh, Isaiah, 54, 17 says that every weapon formed against you shall not prosper and every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. Which means that the weapons that come against you are the tongues that rise in judgment. And if you're waiting for God to condemn them you're in that weird prayer thing that I've just warned you about that you need to literally be condemning them yourself. If someone wants to walk up to me and rebuke me and call me everything but a nice guy, I don't have to listen. I don't have to punch him in the mouth. I don't have to listen either. You can take that talk to the hand. You, you don't have to let things just happen in your life. That's not being kind. It's not being nice to let someone curse you, to let the devil speak his words of death over you through somebody else, to let circumstances speak death over you through what they're... You are to rule and to reign, the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Oh, boy. No one shall stand against you all the days of your life. How can God say that to someone? Doesn't he know there's other people? Yeah, but he also know what he told jo Joshua to do. Be strong and very courageous. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. In the New Testament, you can say it this way. As I was with Jesus, so shall I be with you. What situation did Jesus walk into and go, oh, can you feel the spiritual oppression? I bet you there's demons in here. Quick, disciples, let's pray. Shandai, 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 shandai. Emergency tones. <laughs> Never one time, everywhere Jesus went, he was the God of that place. Where he went, the demons were like, ah, Jesus is here. Mm. 
He walked the gathering demoniac, 6,000 demons. <laughs> and you know what the demon said? Hey, please don't cast us out into nowhere. Can we at least have the pigs? And Jesus is like, yeah, I'm not allowed to eat bacon because I'm a Hebrew. So he <laughs> let them. <laughs> There's actually way more than that, but that's kind of funny. <laughs> but here's, here's, what, here's one of the revelations there. You know, pigs understand, or demons understand authority more than Christians. Demons understood that even in a pig, they have a little bit of authority, and yet Jesus Christ lives in you, and you don't think you have any authority. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will never, God word, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And those are different. Leaving is leaving. Forsaking is forsaking. Because some, some people think like God's like, well, he ain't going to leave me. But man, he's super upset, terrible. He wants to scream and yell at me. No, that would be forsaking you. He's not going to forsake you either. If you're doing bad stuff, he'll tell you you're doing bad stuff and he'll tell you to cut it out. But he's still going to love you. He's still going to embrace you. Next verse, please. Be strong and courageous. Why and? Because I think when a lot of people see verses like this, they kind of like strong and courageous are the same thing. They're not. Strong is how you live it. Courageous is the attitude that pushes it. Strong and courageous, for you shall give these people the inheritance of the land that I swore to their fathers I would give them. You shall give them what I gave them. Man, I hope you get that, because this is a New Testament truth. The New Testament is, truth is Jesus has purchased it, and we need to go and get it. We need to get what was given to us. They had to go possess what was given to them. Heroes fight until their enemy is completely defeated. Heroes fight until their enemy is completely defeated. Don't be satisfied with beating the devil one time on Thursday. You beat him all day Thursday, you beat him all day Friday, you beat him all day Saturday, you eat a piece of cake, you eat him all day, you beat him all day Saturday, you beat him all day Sunday. It's just, it's just part of your day. What are you going to do today? I'm going to please God and whoop the devil. Amen. Amen. You know, after a while, he'll stop coming by your house. You know, even an old mangy dog knows that if it comes up to you and you kick him, after a couple of times, he'll figure out just not come around. Don't you know the devil's a smidge, a smidge smarter than a dog? But because he's never really been punched in the mouth by most Christians, he can just go hang out at their house, sit on your couch, burp and fart, eat Cheetos, and, and wipe the Cheeto dust all over your couch, do terrible stuff to you, use the toilet, leave the seat up. Right, ladies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, I just got them all mad, right? I said, where's the devil? <laughs> I'll get him now. <laughs> but he does that. He, he comes in there because we're just like, what? Who even invited him? I don't know who invited I think it was my wife invited him over. I wish he would leave. Could you just please leave? I'm sorry. Please leave. Lord, please make the devil for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, if I'm sitting on your couch doing all that kind of stuff, and you walk up and you hit me with Louisville Slugger, I'm going to get the message. Uh, I'm a simple guy. And that's a simple message. If the devil's doing that on your couch, then you walk up with the old rugged cross. You say, you got about five seconds to clean that mess up and get to stepping. Yeah. And if he doesn't, count to five. It says you, <laughs> and skip two, three, and four. <laughs> One, five. The, it, the scriptures say, resist the devil and he will 
flee from you. The word flee means to run from as if in terror. You know, the devil is the one that invented fear. Who do you think has the most of it? To run from as if in terror. Well, I resisted the devil and he didn't flee from me. Okay, please don't make me try to believe you over the Bible. It's not going to turn out well for you. The Bible says, God, the word of God, the promise of God says, you resist him, he'll run. Scared of you. As a spirit-filled disciple, the only enemy capable of defeating me is me. Me. We scapegoat the devil all the time. Well, the devil did this. No, you allowed the devil to do that, which means you beat you. Our failures are our failures. Were we tempted? Yeah. I'm not arguing the fact that the devil's a good tempter, but he's not. He cannot control. He cannot force. Neither can God. God will not control you. God will not force you. The devil can't. God won't. You have to make the decision, the final decision. Fine, I'll go watch the terrible, dirty movie. Because I've been thinking about it all day. Ding, 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 ding. You do what you think about. You think you're a hero. You think you're pleasing God. You think you're living your life that way. Guess what you do? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, and I'm going to read this out of the New King James. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, this is the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled. They were physically troubled, which means pressed and afflicted. On every side. They had it rough. There is persecution. There is suffering in a Christian life. I know that people don't understand this balance. But there, it's a reality. If you're doing things for God, you're swimming upstream. When you're swimming upstream, when you're the only fish swimming upstream in the sewage of this world, you're going to get kicked in the head with turt. Or... <laughs> Again, it's just one of my... Logs, logs, logs float downstream. <laughs> I'm going to hear about that one on staff meeting. They were pressed and afflicted on every side. Outside were conflicts. Conflicts are battles or uh, fighting with words. Inside were fears. And that word fear is the Greek word phobios, which is terror, alarm, panic. So they had to fight panic and terror on the inside, and they had to fight legitimate people coming against them on the outside. Rough, rough y'all. Verse 6, nevertheless. <laughs> this is the difference between Paul and a lot of American Christians. Paul had nevertheless. We just... Leave verse 5 out there and hope that everybody feels sorry for us and tells us how great we are on Facebook. Paul had a nevertheless. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. You want to know why having a local body, a local church, is so very important? Because some of you are my Titus. I wonder what would happen if Paul didn't have a Titus. But Paul, I don't, I don't need to have organized religion. I don't need to have no church. I'm going to sit on my couch, watch Facebook Live. Really? What happens if you need a Titus? I don't need no Titus. I'm so holy, such a good Christian. I don't need anybody. Just us four and no more. Okay, good luck. Hope you make it. I've yet to meet the one. I've yet to meet the one to do that for an extended period of time, do little self by themselves home couch church and make it. Yet to meet the one. I'm talking thousands of people that I know. Maybe you'll be the first. Good luck. More power to you. 
As for me, I'm simple. God says do it this way. Local body, gather together, don't forsake the assembling. Okay, good for me. And then the cool thing is every once in a while one of you will walk up and be my Titus. Amen. I, I like Titus. Verse 7. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. So I want you to get this dynamic. So Titus got blessed by the Corinthian church, and then Titus carried this grace, this exhortation, and went and found Paul, who was having a rough time. Now the Corinthian church, this is 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was Paul writing to the Corinthian church and fussing at them for not being very good Christians. And I just synopsized one entire book of the Bible, I know, but basically that what is, that's what it boils down to. He's like, you guys are terrible Christians. You need to get it figured out. Don't do this, start doing this. Don't. That's basically 1 Corinthians. And what, you know, in American Christianity, if I stood up in front of a congregation, I said, stop doing this, start doing this, get it. I can't believe you're doing this. They don't even talk about this in, in the Gentile world. The average church would be like, well, the heck with you. I'm going down to the seeker sensitive church where they pet my tushy. I'll need to sit here and listen to you tell me what to do and what not to do. Who made you God? What the Corinthian church did was like, uh, Paul, with all your telling us what to do, apostleship, and, and, and okay, we'll do it. And they did it. And it worked out well for them. Shocking. It worked out so well that they encouraged Titus like, hey, go tell Paul. We were pretty angry at him when he gave us the truth because remember the truth makes you mad before the truth makes you free. They got pretty mad at him, but then we got over being mad at him and then we got super blessed and then this dude came back into church and we all loved him and the church grew and all these stuff. So Titus, go tell Paul, thanks for the letter that we really didn't like at first. So Titus comes and finds Paul. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Man, it's been rough, bro. Rough. Outside rough, inside rough. Rough. Well, hey, let me help you out. Guess what happened? I just came from the Corinthian church. They were super blessed by your rebuke. Really? Yeah, really. It actually happens. Well, that blesses my heart. I'm actually encouraged right now because that happened. Because Paul says, by the consolation that which he was comforted in you, when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoice even more. Next verse, please, sis. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I don't regret it. Well, Paul's not a very good Christian. Because a good Christian, if they made someone sorry by telling them something, they'd feel terrible. That's right, if you're a good Christian. Well, Paul was a good Christian, and he said, I don't really regret making you feel bad. Paul wasn't as motivated by other people's feelings as most other people are. Because he knew feelings are liars. For even, I, even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it. I, I know that that sounds like there's still a natural part to Paul being a minister, same thing with me. I know when I'm telling someone the truth and they're rejecting it or it's hurting them or they don't like it, there's still that human part of me that's just like, I don't want to do this. Especially like the folks that I personally disciple, they know that. Like, I'm like, I really don't want to say this, but I kind of want to say this because I want you to be free, but I don't want to say it because I don't want you to be hurt. But I want to say it, but I don't want to say it. That's what Paul was saying. I want to tell you, but I don't want to tell you I want you to be free, but I don't want you to hurt. But the thing is, is that sometimes to break free from chains, there's going to be that hurt of you pressing against the steel that's holding you. I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle letter made you sorry, though only for a while. Check this out. If, if you get truth from God... And it, and it hits you and it does that like, ooh. Make sure that's momentary. If you get in there and you live there and you wallow around in that junk, 
you're going to be a destroyed person. And you're going to blame God. And people do this all the time. Next verse, please. Says, now, uh, yeah, now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. Well, that's unique. Because a lot of people show up at funerals just so they can cry and use all the Kleenex. If that sorrow doesn't turn to repentance, then it's going to turn to death. These are your two options. But your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Verse 10. I've used this verse in hundreds of different situations. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Godly sorrow, if you've ever sorrowed with godly sorrow, it has turned into repentance that has brought salvation to your life. Now, salvation, remember, is not being born again. Salvation is preservation, uh, healing. It's, uh, it's all the blessings of God. It, it, salvation is sozo. It's this big thing. It's heaven invading your life is a quick way to say it. So if you've had sorrow that you've turned into repentance and more of heaven has invaded your life, you did it right. But if you've had sorrow of the world, it produces death. That's called depression and oppression. Depression is just slow death. It's slow mental death. Oppression is slow mental death. And some people say, well, I'm, I'm just a depressed person or I'm clinically depressed or this thing happened so I'm depressed. You have a temptation to be depressed, but when that sorrow comes, what you can do is you can actually take that sorrow and use it to find out where things went wrong in your life, turn it into repentance, head the opposite direction, and then God is going to invade your life with heaven. Salvation is going to come. Fear hates what I'm telling you right now. In the NLT, this verse says, listen, this is really good. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and the results are in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. And that is some kind of powerful. Heroes breed heroes. Courage breeds courage. Failure breeds failure. Fear breeds fear. Again, going into, into the family unit, parents, spouses, don't think that whatever you're doing is just for you. If I live in fear, my children get fear. If I live in fear, my wife is going to be subjected to fear no matter how holy she is. If I live in depression, I'm giving depression to my kids. That's the gift that I'm giving to my family. Like breeds like. And the more you have intercourse with those things, the more you bear the fruit. The more you have intercourse with courage and heroism, the more it bears the fruit of courage and makes heroes. The more you have intercourse with fear and failure, the more it breeds fear and failure. 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is famous, David and Goliath. And I promise you I'm not going to preach on this. I just promised it. Then David, verse 45, then David said to the Philistine, hopefully you know this story. I don't have time to give you context. If you don't know the story of David and Goliath, why are you in a church? <laughs> Read a book. Then David said to the Philistine, you came to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin. But I come to you in the name, nature, honor, essence, authority of the Lord of hosts, 
the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. You know, your enemy is not specifically defiling you when he comes after you. In fact, Satan don't even care about you. He's mad at Jesus. And if he can hurt you to get to Jesus, whatever. You probably take this personal. I can't believe that person did this to me. Really? Because it's about you? We're, we're self-centered in both ways. Like, hey, the whole world needs to be about me and, and need to lavish me with all the stuff and things. But then when negative things happen, I can't believe these things happen to me. It's the self-centered stick like has two ends. How about God is not blessing you because you're awesome. He's just blessing you because he's a blesser. And how about Satan is not coming after you because you're so awesome that Satan has to destroy you because you're just the most amazing thing that's ever been birthed. How about you're just in the way while he's trying to destroy Jesus and the kingdom coming and, and the light. If you don't make anything personal, then you can live your life to please God and you can live your life default by just kicking the devil all over the place. Amen. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass of the camp of the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Boy, I tell you what, David is talking some smack. He's a five foot nothing, 17 year old kid with a rock. Uh, please get this. Five foot nothing, 17 year old kid with a rock standing in front of a 10 foot soldier giant who's got so much stuff. He had 120 pounds worth of armor. And he says, not only am I going to take your sorry self, but I'm going to come and pick apart your entire army. <laughs> this is like the dude in high school that's like three foot tall standing in front of the football team saying, I'm going to kick all y'all's butts. And you know, the football team's like, are you for real? This is what Goliath's attitude was. Really? You're going to what? David was so confident. In God. He had nothing to offer in the natural. This is something that will work to your benefit. I said I wasn't going to preach on this. i got to say this fast. This is something that will work to your benefit. The more you believe in your personal physical assets, your ability to be intellectual, your, whatever assets you have in the natural, the more you're going to lean on them, which means the less you're going to lean on the grace of God. The more you lean on the grace of God, the more 10-foot giants are going to fall because you got a rock. Uh, next verse. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran. I won't preach, I won't preach. He ran towards his giant. If the average Christian does, oh my God, there's a giant. David said, hey, there's a giant. I got a rock. You know what everybody behind him was saying? This kid has lost his mind. You know what David was thinking? Thank God I'm not in my mind. Then David put his hand in his bag. That word for bag in the Hebrew, I did a whole study on this. That word bag is purse. Then David put his hand in his purse and took out a stone and slung it while he's running and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face. You know what he did? He bowed to David in death, the giant. Therefore, David ran, still running, and stood over the Philistine like straddled his big fat carcass 
little 17-year-old kid with a purse. <laughs> Drew the sword from the Philistine out of its sheath and killed him with his own sword. This is you against the enemy. That stuff that they're bringing against you, God actually wants you to take it and use it against them. And cut off his head. Second Samuel, so that's first Samuel. So we're going to fast forward 30 years. Second Samuel, verse 23. Now these, I'm just going to read. In Jesus' name. These are the names of the mighty men that David had. That guy's name from that place, the chief of the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. Please get that. That's Pearl City. He, he took on a Pearl City size army by himself. Heroes breed heroes. Courage breeds courage. Verse 9, and after him was Eleazar, the son of a dodo. <laughs> Amen. So if you come from a terrible family, if you come from a family of dodos, <laughs> just call yourself a Dino. I'm a Dino the dodo. Oh, wait, Eleazar, sorry. That's <laughs> what happens when you, you don't stick with the spirit. Dodo the, uh, uh, that. One of the three mighty men with David when they defiled the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. He got so into the groove, he couldn't even put the sword down. Hey, you can imagine he gets done and he comes home and his wife's like, hey, 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 hey. Sorry, honey, I can't put the sword down. We'll talk tomorrow. <laughs> he arose and attacked the Philistine until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. You know, all the people, we got your back, buddy. You go kill them for us. We'll come get the stuff. Amen. That's what it feels like when you're out there fighting. You're by yourself and then you win and everybody's like, hey, thanks for all the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where were you? And after him was Shama. I can say Shama, the son of a G, the, I don't know why their names are so hard. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. You know what lentils are? Beans. It is a bean patch. Homeboy was standing there at the bean patch. All Philistines came and said, we want the bean patch. And then Shama says, uh-uh, in my little bean patch. Verse 12, and he stationed himself in the middle of the field, my bean patch. Well, beans aren't worth anything. Why are you fighting for beans? This is my family. This is my marriage. This is my blessings that God gave me. You might not think it's a big deal. You might not like it. It might not look like much to you, but this is mine. God gave me this. I'm going to defend this with everything. And he stood in the middle of a bean patch. And killed an army. God bless Shama. Heroes breed heroes. And so the Lord brought about a great victory. Verse 20, Benaniah was the son of Ju that guy, the son of a valiant man from, Kabs I don't know, who had done many deeds, who had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He had also gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. It's like they're like bragging about it. I'm so hero, I'm literally looking for the most terrible circumstances to be hero in. I'm going to go fight someone in a pit on a snowy day that's like a lion. Fine, I'll one-up you when it's my turn then. This, can you see what David produced? These are guys that were produced from David. They're, these stories aren't before David. I'm not reading pre-David, this is post-David. David became a hero that slayed a giant, and now he's got a whole group of people that are surrounding him like, hey, I'll go fight a lion in a, in a pit on a snowy day. Hey, I'll, I'll defend a bean field. I'll take out 800 people by myself. And these were people that surrounded David because heroes breed heroes. Courage breeds courage. That's what God's raising you up to be. 
Jesus said, John chapter 14, verse 12, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works shall you do, because I go to my father. David slayed a giant. His guys that came after him slayed armies. Jesus slayed the devil. The people that come after him will do what? Use your imagination. What is the Lord calling you to do? The one that went before you, that bred you as a hero, slayed Satan in darkness. You can slay whatever's in front of you, no matter if it's an army or if it's a single mountain or a single giant. Last verse. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. When you see Jesus, your hero, your victor, standing over top of the carcass of Satan in hell, and he takes that sword of the word of God and he chops off the head of Satan. And he says, I now have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Now you, my people, go into all the world, lay hands on the sick, see him recover, cast out demons, raise the dead. If you see your hero slay the, the head of Goliath, Satan, then you can come after him and say, all right, Jesus got one, I'm getting 800. And the demons will tremble with fear because you walked into the room. All right, please rise, I wanna bless you. Please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.